case number five from uh, the Paramedicine 101 Facebook site. Here's the scenario that goes along with this EKG case. You respond to a 65-year-old male at home. His daughter called 911 for him because she's worried about her dad. She says he's sick. Uh, he's, she says he gets short of breath very easily, and he's been really weak. And this is not normal for him. Uh, you're looking at a 400-pound patient sitting in a recliner. He's pretty much in his underwear, and it is apparent that he never gets up out of this chair. Uh, he does not want to be checked out. He does not want to go to the hospital. Uh, but after you know a little bit of uh, you know sales pitch, he allows you to to check him out because of his daughter's concerns. He states that he's always weak and it's normal for him to get short of breath when he gets up. He doesn't have any allergies and he's got a whole gamut of medications. Um, he, here's the important ones. He's on glucophage, uh, gabapentin, albuterol, singular, prevacid. Uh, this is just poor egg here. Enalapril, which is an ACE inhibitor, digoxin, aspirin, and oxygen. All right, well, we get a lot from these medications. He's got diabetes. Uh, glucophage is metformin. It's a type 2 diabetic medication. Gabapentin, neuropathy for neuropathy. Uh, albuterol, some sort of breathing ailment, probably asthma or COPD. Singular, again, asthma or COPD. Prevacid, probably got some GERD. Uh, Caravitolol, that's Coreg. Uh, Coreg is a, a beta blocker common for uh, CHFers. Enalapril, ACE inhibitor, also uh, it's an anti-hypertension medication commonly used for CHFers. Digoxin, okay, he can either have some sort of arrhythmia or sometimes this is used for people with heart failure. Aspirin and oxygen, okay, so he says he's got a history of uh, heart attack, CHF, asthma, he's a non-insulin dependent diabetic, and he's got an AICD. And, and, and whenever you see AICD, a lot of times an AICD, which is a implanted cardiac defibrillator, a lot of times it's a combo with a pacemaker. Okay? Yes, sir. He says the last thing he had to eat was Oreos and he, he ate it with some orange juice. Sounds delicious. He's sitting in his chair, of course, and that's when it began. So here's his EKG. We do a 12 lead EKG because he allows us to check him out. Uh, his vitals to go along with the EKG, he's hypotense with a blood pressure of 61 over 37. I know those are odd numbers. They came off the monitor. This is an actual call that I ran. Uh, that's his blood pressure from his left arm. He's setting at 83% and he's on two liters of his at-home oxygen. His pulse is 40 and regular. His respiratory rate is 30 and regular, and his skin is pale, cool, clammy. This dude is sick, right? I mean, we can, we know this is not a normal blood pressure for anybody, really. Uh, he's hypoxic, on oxygen. He's he's got a bradycardic heart rate, which, with a hype with hypotension, is pretty significant, and he is, uh, he, he is dyspneic. He's got some labored respirations. And he's pale, cool, and clammy. He looks shocky, okay? And look at this 12 EDKG because that's why everybody listens to these cases. So this 12 EDKG is pretty interesting. I mean, off the bat, we know it's slow. His, his uh, pulse is palpated at 40. Um, what else stands out about it? Well, if, if you normally read EKGs uh, like a lot of us were taught to do, the first thing you do is you look at your leads to make sure they're on, and you say lead one should be up, but it's down. And AVR, I don't even know. Is, is that up or is it down? It's kind of small. Uh, maybe it's a little biphasic. So the axis seems off. There's quite a few things that can cause that. What else stands out? Well, these things stand out, don't they? What are those? You see them here, a little bit smaller. You see them here. Those are pacer spikes. Those are actually pacer spikes. We've all, we've all been able to identify pacer spikes, right? Um, and it makes sense because he said he has a AICD. He also has a pacemaker. But what's going on with this pacemaker? A pacer spike here is not causing the QRS complex here, right? So we're not getting capture from this pacemaker. Uh, it, the, the pacemaker is still firing, but there's no capture. There's a few things that can cause that. One of them would be uh, a misplaced pacer wire. You know, his pacer wire could have come loose. Uh, and, there, and there's something else. And this is not his pacer wires in the right spot. Not that I checked or anything, but uh, knowing the results from this case, I can tell you that the, it's not because the 
the pacer is malfunctioning. What's happening here is something called hyperkalemia, hyperkalemia, which I, I believe most of us are familiar with. And how can we tell that we have hyperkalemia from this EKG? Well, the, the biggest thing that stands out here is not that we're not getting capture. To me, it, it, it's this wide QRS complex. Look at the QRS complex in V1 because they stay pretty much the, the same width throughout. It's just kind of hard to identify where it begins and where it ends. This QRS complex is very wide. First off, you have to know where it is. So it, it begins right about there. Hold on. I drew that first line a little bit off. Right about there. And it ends right maybe right about there. That is greater than 200 milliseconds or as most people know it, 0 0.20 seconds. That's a horrible color. Let me try a different color here. The QRS is greater than 200 milliseconds, which is the same as saying 0 0.20 seconds. In fact, it's much greater than that, right? Because we know that one of these, one of these boxes here is, uh, is 200 milliseconds wide, or 0 0.20 seconds wide. So that's very wide. What causes QRS complexes to be wide? Well, we know that ventricular rhythms can cause a QRS complex to be wide. And if this was just simply a complete AV block, you would have you know, a, the possibility of an underlying idioventricular rhythm that would keep the pace going at a bradycardic rate. And that would be you know, something that we're used to. If this was a, a supraventricular rhythm that had a barency like a bundle branch block, that could also be wide. But when you get into the range of greater than 200 milliseconds wide, or, or one box wide, you're looking at something else. It's got to be something else causing this. And in this case, it's hyperkalemia. Um, and that, that's a very common case. Hyperkalemia, Dr. Amo Matsu, who's like the EKG guru uh, of ASEP, of emergency physicians, he, um, he talks about hyperkalemia as the syphilis of electrocardiography. Meaning, I guess syphilis kind of mimics a lot of things. I don't know a whole lot about syphilis, but I'm going to trust that he's telling the truth, that it mimics a lot of different things in medicine. Well, in electrocardiography, hyperkalemia can mimic anything. Uh, bradycardias, tachycardias, uh, it can look like STEMI, even though it's not. It can uh, cause death, obviously. So there's a lot of different things that hyperkalemia can do to an EKG, and this is one of them, a wide QRS complex. This is... Uh, you know, right here, almost like a sine wave. It's kind of going the wrong way, though. Usually a sine wave, I'll show you it in, the, in the next slide or two here, uh, goes from the tip of the S wave, called the nadir, to the peak of the T wave in that direction. Whenever you see a straight line from the tip of your QRS to the peak of the T wave, we have inverted T waves here. I'm, and, you know, that's a kind of a, a guess that this must be the repolarization right there. So we have inverted T waves. Whenever your QRS go complex goes right into the T wave like that, you got to be concerned about hyperkalemia. Whenever you have a bradycardia, hyperkalemia should be on your list of differential diagnosis. And the fact that this patient has an implanted pacemaker that's not functioning, and you have these wide QRS complexes, that is clinically evident of hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia can cause, uh, because, because of the extracellular ions, the extracellular potassium, or serum potassium as we know it, it can cause uh, the pacemaker to not function appropriately. It, it increases the, the uh, or it alters the threshold of the pacemaker. And this means that your pacemaker probably won't work. In fact, this patient, I tried pacing. I gave actually, I followed the, the bradycardic algorithm. I don't, we don't carry calcium uh, where I work, so I couldn't, you know, call in good orders for that. But I followed the bradycardic algorithm and gave him atropine, uh, tried pacing. Neither one of those were effective. Uh, eventually, I gave him dopamine because I wanted a lot of blood pressure effect. Uh, this patient did not have a history of renal failure, and that's not common for these hyperkalemic cases. In fact, he has a, a history of CHF, so he went into acute renal failure due to the CHF. And that, and that happens because we use our, our renin angiotensin aldosterone system from the kidneys a lot with, a, uh, with CHF. I mean, that's kind of the compensatory mechanism that causes CHF. And uh, these patients commonly go into renal failure. And, and, you know, a lot of it's because of the fluid overload. So he went into acute renal failure. His serum potassium level was 8, which is very high. Okay, anything over 6.5, I believe, 
uh, can be lethal. So a serum potassium level of eight was very, very high. Um, bradycardia was, was one of his issues, but you know, he had, he had renal failure, so that's pretty lethal. So that's this EKG, and I wanted to show some more examples. Here's what, what I was talking about, a sine wave right here. Okay, that's a sine wave. Um, and a sine wave is when you have a, a wave go from the tip of the S wave, that's called the nadir, nadir, N-A-D-I-R, I believe, uh, to the peak of the T wave, and it's a straight line. You see how that's a straight line? That's called a sine wave. And what happens is you can get a pattern that looks a lot like ventricular tachycardia because you will end up with something like this, okay? And uh, it's due to hyperkalemia. Again, hyperkalemic T waves, we're, we're familiar with these peak T waves here, right? Um, they're narrow based, not like hyperacute T waves generally, and they are symmetrical and very, very tall, okay? Very, very tall. And generally you'll see that, uh, proportionately, they're very tall in all leads on a 12 lead. Uh, it's very common where hyperacute T waves generally uh, only appear in the leads of the affected myocardium. Okay, so looking at this EKG, we see some peak T waves where I have my arrows pointing. Um, this is uh, just an EKG I found on Google. This is not one of the patients I ran on or anything. Very peak T waves, and you notice um, they're very tall. They might not be so tall over here, but they're still uh, symmetrical and, 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 you know, skinny, so, so to speak. And as the potassium level rises, or as the patient is not treated, uh, they, they begin to get something like this, a sine wave pattern. And what happens is that you'll see that the P waves almost begin to disappear. Their QRS widens, and they get a, a straight line from the tip of the nadir to the peak of the T wave. Okay, so that's uh, another example of a sine wave and a wide QRS complex from hyperkalemia. Here was the example from this week. Hopefully you learned something from this case and enjoyed the discussion on hyperkalemia. Uh, I'm sorry if you didn't get the answer correctly. I mean, calling it a complete heart block isn't technically wrong, but I really wanted to drive home the point of what was causing this. And those very wide QRS complexes, uh, the fact that the patient's own implanted pacemaker is not functioning appropriately anymore, these all kind of lead towards uh, acute hyperkalemia. So I hope you enjoyed this. I will see you next time. Have a good one.